All right, good evening. Good evening. So, Hello. my lifelong relationship with music has been like trying to hug a puffer fish. <laughs> Challenging. I was that kid who took my violin absolutely everywhere. And music was everything to me. House music, Pink Floyd, folk, women's music, classical, but my favorite is Baroque. I love Bach, I love Vivaldi. For a wedding march, I always thought I'd have Handel's water music. Interesting story, I didn't have Handel's water music, but I did have a destination wedding. Um, my wife and I are gay, you probably figured that out, we're white. And uh, we got married in 2010, and we wanted to go somewhere where it's legal, and we wanted a destination wedding. So we chose Iowa. <laughs> So uh, I have played the tune Amazing Grace on the violin. That was my mother's favorite hymn. I have played it more interesting places than you can ever imagine. Um, one example. So I found myself on a Mother's Day in the teeny town of Mesopotamia, Ohio, at a United Methodist Church surrounded by ex-Amish who were struggling with their relationship with their mothers. I mean, they were. It was, it was something else. Um, and I played in numerous churches. And I played the violin in numerous churches because I really like God. But until I was 30, I never joined a church because I wasn't sure that the people who like God would like me. But when I came out uh, to my mom, she said, well, can you still talk to God? I was like, yeah. She said, okay, if you're good with God, you're good with me. And then my mom cried. And she didn't cry because I'm gay. She cried because she hoped I wouldn't have a hard life because I'm gay. That's the mother who I love. And I was one lucky kid. So I played the violin all over the place, in orchestra and musicals and Christmas Eve and for fun. I even carried it on the plane when I went to see my brother in LA because I was cool. Yeah. Yes, that made me cool. Um, but then it came to a grinding halt. So when my mom, Ruth McIntosh, died in 97, my heart just ripped open. And she died right after a surgery where her heart had been ripped open. Mm -hmm. And music, even though it was such an integral part of my life, all of a sudden, I couldn't handle music. I couldn't hear hymns in church. I couldn't listen to music. I couldn't hear the radio in the car. They don't give us little windshield wipers for our eyes. Right. I would hear music and I'd start crying. Here's the thing, I don't cry. Growing up, my mom always said, something is terribly wrong if Joyce cries. But I started missing it, like missing it really bad because it was such a part of my life. So I thought, I'm going to do something fun. I'm going to take fiddle lessons. And you know what? It worked. No one can be unhappy with reels and hornpipes and jig and clapping and a pint. We're in the right place for that. It was awesome. Then when I moved to Chicago in 2002, I joined a gorchestra. That's a gay orchestra. <laughs> and I joined it to meet people and play music and have fun. And it was life-changing, and the people I met there were amazing. My friend Kim Denelt was the conductor at the time, wonderful composer. Look up Kim Denelt. Um, she's also very tall and serious and has this deep, sexy voice. And I found her a little intimidating, and here I am surrounded by Chicago musicians, not Southwest Michigan musicians. And so after the first rehearsal, I said, should I come back? She said, do you own a metronome? And I was like, yeah, get it out, use it, and come back next week. Well, I'm still there. I'm still there at work. And my standing, 
And my stand partner, an awesome guy named Ian, he's an Episcopal priest in Milwaukee now, but he's a great friend and he played the violin at my father's memorial service. I had reclaimed music and the violin and I was having fun. And I also met some cool DJs. <laughs> There's one in the house. Um, but then in December of 2013, the music crashed again. My family, we hit a few bumps. Actually, it was more like going off the half pipe at a snowboard park, but with no snowboard, bam. My second son wanted to come out way before a person is supposed to. He's not gay. He was premature by nine years. So, he was supposed to be my Valentine's baby, but he was born during Advent. And for those who aren't familiar with it, Advent's a time of waiting, a time of waiting for Jesus. It's also become a time of waiting to eat a piece of candy every day in December. Um, but when I was in the hospital, after giving birth to him nine weeks early, that same week, my wife was diagnosed with extensive and advanced breast cancer. And survival mode did not include playing music, playing the violin. That advent, it meant waiting for doctors and NICU visits and treatment plans and brain scans. But when Joe turned two, that was my baby boy, when he turned two, I had a better advent. I was waiting for cookies to come out of the oven and for my wife to bring our older son home from the zoo and Joe could sit in a high chair and he could eat, so hell yes, you can have more cookies. And I thought, I'm going to turn on some Christmas carols. And I heard, oh holy night, and I heard the tenor hit the high note and I cried. It was okay, but I cried because it was still a little bit emotional. But I thought, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to stick my toes back in gingerly. So I started going to church again. It turns out they still play hymns there. But I started back up. I did my first stand-up gig, and I ended my set playing Amazing Grace on the violin. It doesn't sound funny, but it was. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's all about the timing. It really was funny. And then for my 50th birthday, I got a tat. And I'm not going to strip, don't worry. But it's a, it's a sleeve. And the bottom of it is an empty musical staff. Because no music in life is flapping. And the dove of peace is flying up through a rainbow. Had to get in the gay Christian thing. But then the top, the top of my tat is, is the high the high note from Oh Holy Night at the top of my shoulder, because hitting the high note, that's life. So last year I got another music wake-up call, which brings us up to now. When you have a heart surgery like the one that my mom had, um, you end up with a scar, they call it a zipper, because they crack you open, and then when you heal up, you get a zipper. Well, last year my heart got cracked open, but instead of deciding to zip up the music, I let it pour back in. So one year ago, my friend Angie Bjorgi died. And Bjorgi was my age, was 50 years old, and dynamic and wild and smart and crazy and fun. And in college, we were like frat brothers, except I was the nerdy one that would clean up the house every Saturday and Sunday morning. Yeah. And I, um, well, and every weekend we'd be like filling the house with music. Melissa Etheridge and Prince and Time for the Percolator. Do, 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 do. I'm going to whole dance. <laughs> Pull it up online. It's watch kids do the percolator. It's awesome. So I went to her service in Detroit with a little bit of hesitation because when I had moved to Chicago, I really left. And I emotionally and physically left a lot of my friends there, and I wasn't present for them. 
But I walked into that funeral home and I felt home and it, I felt comfortable. I felt fully me. And that includes music. While I was there, I reconnected with another friend, Peggy, who hears music more deeply and perfectly than anyone I've met. And I think she prevented another musical crash. She'd send me a song of the day, tell me how something sounds on her crazy good stereo. She calls it her baller stereo. Can I just say that if this thing's turned up on the bass, it will rattle the foundation of her house. So she doesn't try that. She says she doesn't know music. I call that bullshit. Um, because she does, and she kept it present with me, and she reminded me about the pieces of myself that I had quit seeing and living out. And then last month, I got to go meet my great niece, which makes me feel old, um, but I got to meet her when she was six weeks old, and her name is Nola. And I went to see her in upstate New York, and my niece had music kind of thum, 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 throughout the whole house. My niece's name is Arane. That's the Greek deity of peace. I think Arane is, Arane is the Greek deity of cool new moms. Wow. And she looked at me and she's like, Aunt Joy, she really likes house. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and my eight-year-old son, my older son, takes Irish dance. Those fiddle tunes are now coming in handy. I knew it would be useful for something. So these days, I am listening to and playing music. And I might cry. I might cry like something is terribly wrong. Because something is terribly wrong. The woman who made me and stood next to me in church belting out hymns and woke me up every morning, okay, I kid you not, here's the piano, here's the wall, here's my bed on the other side of the wall, and she'd sing, rise and shine and give God your glory, glory. That was fun. Not, not. No teenager wants to claim that. Yeah. She sang loudly and with vigor. And uh, I miss that. And she's gone. And the friend who walked with me for decades when we came out of the closet, and who I partied with and went to concerts with and talked about our future with and who we grow old with and what our kids would be like is gone. But I'm not. I'm still here. The music's still here. And as Mary Chapin Carpenter says, I'm not running. I'm not hiding. I'm not reaching. I'm just resting in the arms of the great wide open. I'm going to pull my soul in and I'm almost home. Thank you. Yeah.